I do hope you all had a very, very happy Valentine's Day yesterday. Captain Blood. It was a great movie. You disagree. It was made in the heyday of Hollywood when uh, the word Hollywood itself evoked the images of glamour, rich money, and magic and stars and fantastic automobiles and these fantastic lifestyles in Beverly Hills. And the stars were stars. Greta Garbo, Lillian Gish, Tyrone Power, Betty Davis, Humphrey Bogart, Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, John Wayne, etc., 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 etc. None of today's pimple-faced teenagers <laughs> whose fame rests within the imagination of special effects department. Today's movie idols are not stars. They are dust falling into the dirt. <laughs> In those days, people went to see movies. Um, let's go and see a movie. And they would go to a neighborhood movie house. They used to be called palaces. And they were palaces. Ceiling 50 feet high. Pictures. The ceiling was all painted and angels flying and uh, was a palace of only the popes could imagine anything like that but these were the palaces cinema palaces all over United States today people who go to movies they know directors names they know titles they know the David Lynch Fellini, Coppola, Cropola, uh, Spielberg, Sh whatever it is, Tarantella, they all know these things now. And um, before this, people didn't know directors' names. Most of them were Germans or Hungarians, mostly. You know, last uh, time. You looked at this movie, uh, Captain Blood, it was directed by a Hungarian. Everybody knows him as uh, <laughs> Michael Curtis, but he's not. His n real name was Mihaly Kertes. He was hung Hungarian. When people went to see movies, they didn't went to see directors. The only director they knew in those days was Cecile B. DeMille. Somebody that, that very, very few of you know even today, but that's the only director that was known to people. By people, I mean people who worked for their living, not going to college. They worked. And the decision was um, uh, not which movie to see, but which movie palace to go to. And. Uh, on a date or something in Brooklyn or Manhattan. Uh, that's the world I know. I know nothing about Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Uh, so they said, let's go to the RKO movie palace, and they'll go to RKO. Today is a problem now. Uh, people read reviews. They see snips and all these talk talk shows on television because before any movie is released they have to have a talk talk appearance so before they see the movie they know all about the movie they even know that it's bad or good I think it takes joy out of movie watching yes there's no more surprise no magic anymore All right, the Captain Blood was made before 
all this nonsense started before auteur theory started. If you don't know what that is, you will learn it later in the semester. Auteur theory started in France by Cahiers de Cinema group. The infamous people, and you, since you are in the academy, you'll learn all about that. And I thank God that all these three people who started auteur theory, all of them recanted. Godard, Truffaut, and our own American counterpart of the holy trio, Andrew Saris. I saw them all going down on their knees, said, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, I sinned. Because they propagated cinema of what's known as auteur theory. If you don't know what that is, leave it at that. It's not important. Before the multiple screen cinemas came into being, and I was told that in Kansas City, Kansas City, there is one cinema with 28 screens, 28, all showing three movies. Oh, I, I wish we would be back, perhaps, into the time when you went into the cinema. There were no time schedules, no time movie calendars published, because movies were being shown continuously. The feature ends, then the newsreel for 10 minutes, a short cartoon, then a Boy Scout five minute adventure, climbing mountains, and then the feature, and it goes on and on and on. It never stops. There are no lights on in the theater at any time. It's a, a continuous shine, and so you could walk in any time. You walk in the middle of the movie. You could sit there all day long, seeing over and over the same movie, which um, on Times Square in New York, uh, that used to be a good place for to sleep. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Um, uh, Last time I showed Captain Blood, one of my students brought me, gave me this book, Captain Blood. Actually, there's a book. I didn't know that, actually. And in the book, there are pictures. Let's see if I can see one. Who is the picture? Oh, there are pictures. I know, there are pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Captain Blood sneaking around the corner here. Uh, and the pictures are taken from Vitograph picture production, silent movie called Captain Blood. I was trying to get a copy of it. I can't track it any place. And I actually, I wanted to do it as a double feature, silent and sound, but uh, I couldn't get a copy of it. But I appreciate very much the student who gave me this book, which I haven't read yet. I have seen the movie, so I don't have to read the book anymore. You see, you see the pictures all over the place, yeah. Uh, when I saw this, I remember very well, I was a child, basically, and it opened to me this magic world that I didn't know when I was on the, on the farm growing up with cows and sheep. It opened a window window in this fantastic world, inhabited by kings and pirates, ships sailing across the ocean. I didn't know what an ocean was, of course. Also, I didn't know at that time that all that was done in the studio. <laughs> all that ocean was in the studio. <laughs> I know today. <laughs> uh, 
I will refresh your memory that when I saw this movie, Captain Blood, I still haven't seen electric bulb, telephone, or airplane. Also, I haven't seen a black person. I remember vaguely when I was perhaps 11 or so, I was taken to the next town to see a circus. And there was a black person in it. And I was searching my memory, and I cannot remember. All I remember the fact that there was. Other, I'm sure this person was not exhibited as a black person next to the leopard, but he, this person most likely was doing something, but I have no memory of what this person did. But also I have not tasted orange, banana, or a grape. And I have never had a single toy in my life. After the movie, I walked home. It was cold and dark to the, through the country roads, five kilometers. That's about three miles. At night, and um, before I left, I looked at the church tower and uh, remember the time to, that it showed. So I knew that to go home it would be about 25 minutes or half an hour. So when I got home, I reset the wall clock. That's the only way we could set the clock. Not that it, it meant anything to us, but there was no radio, no uh, any other means of setting clocks. When I got home, I joined my father, who was making ropes. The light that illuminated the room was coming from the open uh, oven, wood oven. And all winter, the way I remember, my father always made ropes. Long ropes, short ropes, big, small ones. And I joined him in making ropes. When I think of all those ropes we made, year after year, night after night, might be ten now, what did we do with all those ropes? Where are these ropes today? And uh, I do lose sleep sometimes thinking about those ropes. Where are they? I don't know. When I was a boy, 14 years old, World War, World War II started. Politically, I was naive. I did not understand the forces that were pulling the world apart. Stalin, Hitler, Churchill, Roosevelt. Yes, Roosevelt. Roosevelt sold my country to Stalin for nothing. I always said, done with Roosevelt. I remember clearly the day the Red Army of Soviet Russia occupied my country. It was, it was June 17th. It was my name day. In our country, we didn't celebrate birthdays. We celebrated name days. And um, the neighbors would make a flower wreath and they would be hanging it on your door at night so you, you don't see it. So when you get up in the morning, you see there are flowers. And uh, the Red Army was passing through and it, they thought all these flowers were in their honor, which were not. In 
in six months, a quarter of my people were shipped to Siberia. Any farmer who had more than 18 acres of land was considered exploiter and was shipped to Siberia. Anybody who had a business, anybody who had employed anybody to work for business was shipped to Siberia to die because they were exploiters. They were not workers. So when you hear right now the Serbs um, doing ethnic cleansing on, in Kosovo, they did not invent ethnic cleansing. Not even Hitler invented that, though he was good. Stalin invented ethnic cleansing and he was better than anyone who came after him. So the Red Army occupied my country and naturally I started to study Russian. Push, Pushkin was a big one, poet Pushkin. Nachevala tichka zelotaya, na grudiu tolsa velitana, utrom put anamunchalas rana, polazuri viesali grala. Those who know Russian, please do not correct me. Uh, I try to remember this from oh, about 50 years back. Uh, but the good news with the Red Army, Red Army brought cinema to the villages. Uh, they were true to what Lenin had said when Lenin started the Soviet revolution. Uh, Lenin said, and I quote him in translation, cinema is the opium for the people. And uh, the Red Army was very, very conscious of this and they changed movies twice a week and uh, we saw movies where beautiful girls would be driving tractors and uh, people would say, hey, hey, bravo, workers of the world unite. And uh, a year later, the Germans, the Nazis occupied my country after Stalin had deported a quarter of my people to Siberia to die, Germans started to round up, round up all the Jews, naturally, um, made them dig their own graves, and were shot. I saw them being marched, them, Jews, being marched down the street of my town, in small groups. They were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk because sidewalks were for the people, decent people. The Jews were marked, marched down the, the middle of the street. I saw their graves too. When the Germans occupied my country, I worked in a hardware store and uh, the cashier was an old man, Jew. And the moment he realized that the Germans were coming, he gave the key to the, to the cash register to me and left the building. Three weeks later, it was a beautiful June evening, warm. I was walking and I saw him again. He was being marched alone down the street. I saw him, he looked at me 
it did recognize me. To this day, I still feel guilty. Why did not give him a sign of Why didn't I give him a sign of recognition? Uh, most likely, I was the last person he recognized. Of course, he was, he was shot. That was in 1942, on a June night. And it was a beautiful evening. 58 years ago, I still feel guilty. I'll be, I'll be right back. My political consciousness uh, matured very quickly. I joined the underground to fight the Germans by sabotage and propaganda leaflets. Uh, looking back, uh, it makes no sense almost. Why to defeat Germans? Russians will come. We are doomed no matter what. Small nations are always at the mercy of the big monsters. And today I say, damn with power nations. Superpower USA sold Lithuania to Soviet Russia for a few rubles. United States was a mean and sinister force in the hands of Roosevelt. US had radio stations all over Europe and Asia, Voice of America, Voice of Freedom, Voice of Free Europe, Voice of Treason. The World War II ended in 45. The Red Army reoccupied Lithuania once more. But the United States continued to agitate and encourage resistance over the radio, leaflets dropped from the airplanes, spies. As late as 1970, 25 years after the war, war had ended, they still continued to broadcast, resist, go, kill Red Army, go, we'll come to save you. Because of these fools, fools and treacherous United States propaganda, Voice of America, Voice of Liberty, 15 radio stations in Europe financed by CIA sending propaganda 24 hours a day. They are still doing it today to all other countries. They are responsible for half a million of my Lithuanians dead because they continue to resist the Red Army when there was not a chance in hell that they would be rescued what the radio said, we are coming to rescue you. That's what Roosevelt did. When the war started to go bad for the Germans, 
They rounded up Lithuanians and sent them to Germany to force labor camps to work in the factories. I was one of them. So what does it mean to live in a concentration camp or go through war? You have seen documentaries, you have seen war movies, hundreds of them, Warner Brothers and Columbia and anything you want, hundreds of them. Soldiers reading letters from home, making jokes about Brooklyn and uh, complaining about Chow. And at the end, the music swells and everybody's happy and uh, the end. Is this the war? And what is life in a concentration camp? Up at 4 a.m., marched to work without any food or any clothing for winter or without much rest. Living in a concentration camp is like um, living in a hotel for the damned. It's, it sounds like a great movie title for a movie, Hotel for the Damned. That's what it was. And you have only one thought when you live there. Live, survive at any cost. At any cost, you have to survive. All your attention is directed normally to food, sleep, and the conservation of energy. To live under any conditions, to stay alive. And forget slogans, live free or die. Forget those bumper stickers. Bullshit. People who made those bumper stickers don't know what it means to die or be dead. Because living is much better than being dead. And when you are dead, you know you are dead. You don't live. And when you are living, you can change the world. And you can live forever. And what is freedom? How much freedom does one need to survive? Not much. Also, sometimes I don't know what the freedom is. In a concentration.